Hello everyone, I'm Jeannie Gaudula in Paris. Ten years ago this week, U.S. investment bank Lehman Brothers collapsed, unleashing a global financial crisis. That crash and the slow climb back to normal is the focus of this Inside the Americas. September 15th marks the 10-year anniversary of what became known as Lehman Weekend, when U.S. investment bank Lehman Brothers collapsed in the thick of the 2008 subprime mortgage meltdown. It was the biggest bankruptcy in American history, leading up to the world's worst economic crisis since the 1930s Great Depression. Brian Quinn takes a look back. Monday, September 15th, 2008. Lehman Brothers files the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history, precipitating the global financial crisis. It's not good. It sucks. How did it happen? In the mid-2000s, the U.S. real estate market was on fire, fueled by cheap credit. With interest rates low, investors seeking better returns looked for new investments, and Wall Street saw an opportunity. New investment vehicles allowed bankers to bundle thousands of individual mortgages together into bonds. As homeowners paid their mortgage every month, that money was pooled and paid out to the investors who bought those bonds. Before long, most mortgages from America's pool of qualified borrowers, the so-called prime market, had already been bundled and sold off. Rather than watch profits dry up, brokers and banks turned to the subprime market, less qualified borrowers with bad credit histories or unstable income. From 2001 to 2006, the subprime share of the mortgage market more than doubled. The risky debt was packaged together with safer debt, then split up and sold off, often without investors or banks knowing the content of prime versus subprime debt in their bonds. To boost returns, banks borrowed to exponentially increase the stake and thus the payoffs of their bets in a practice known as leverage. Profits soared. But the good times wouldn't last. As subprime borrowers began to default, housing prices started to fall. Defaults sped up, and banks everywhere found themselves saddled with enormous loads of bad debt mixed in with the good. No one was sure anymore what their portfolios were worth. Thus, whether or not they could afford to keep lending to each other. And the crucial interbank credit system that keeps major financial institutions solvent began to freeze up. By 2007, subprime mortgage brokers started to go bankrupt and real estate hedge funds began to fail. By 2008, the situation was spinning out of control. In March, Wall Street's fifth largest investment bank, Bear Stearns, was saved at the last minute from bankruptcy, sold to J.P. Morgan Chase for pennies on the dollar. The U.S. government guaranteed Bear's bad debt to seal the deal, fearing irreparable damage to the financial system if it was allowed to go under. Bear was too big to fail. Given the current exceptional pressures on the global economy and financial system, the damage caused by default by Bear Stearns could have been se severe and extremely difficult to contain. In July, the government was forced to rescue mortgage giants Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in a $187 billion bailout the largest in U.S. history. With panic spreading, Wall Street looked for who would be the next to fall. Number one on the list was Lehman Brothers, with massive exposure to the crumbling mortgage market after years of buying in big. Its stock price tanking, Lehman, with the government's help, tried to find a buyer, but no luck. After a summer of rescues, the political appetite for another huge Wall Street bailout was gone, and the 150-year-old firm was finished. CEO Dick Fold insisted he had done all he could to save it. Based on the information that we had at the time, I believed that these decisions and actions were both prudent and appropriate. In the panic that followed Lehman's bankruptcy, even larger government bailouts were yet to come, and the worst of the financial crisis was just getting started. Adam Tooze is the author of Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the World. He's also a historian and professor at Columbia University, and he joins me now from New York. Adam, thanks so much for joining us. Here we are 10 years after the fall of Lehman Brothers, after the global financial crisis, which for many people back then seemed like the end of the world. Now looking back on it with a little perspective, just how bad was it? <laughs> 
it could really have been the end of the world in financial terms. I think this really is the key point to take away. It's a bit like, say, the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. We stared over the abyss, into the abyss. We saw we saw how terrifying the total implosion of the global financial system could have been because this was not simply an American crisis. This was a transatlantic crisis. All of the major banks in Europe were too deeply involved uh, to have survived. Uh, Europe had its own real estate bubbles that were even bigger than those of the United States. So what was threatening was really the, the end of the world in financial terms. But we also pulled back. So we live really with that double experience of having faced total apocalypse and having survived it by means of measures which were, in their own right, spectacularly radical and un historically unprecedented. Now, in the United States, at least, the financial crisis really seemed to highlight the real division between entitled America and poor America. Do you agree with that? I absolutely do. Um, it didn't create inequality in the United States. Uh, but it highlighted its significance in political terms. Uh, the banks, the investment banks, got stabilized, bailed out. Many of their shareholders, of course, took losses, but they were also in a much better position to absorb those losses than lower income Americans who were at the bottom of the food chain. 10 million American families lost their homes. It's the biggest forced movement of Americans since the days of John Steinbeck, Grapes of Wrath and the, you know, the 1930s agricultural migration. It hits African-American communities, Latino communities, much harder than any other groups in American society. So this is a polarizing event in American society. A huge surge in wealth inequality follows from this crisis. When you look at today's world in politics, there is a massive political division today. Can that be linked back in any way to the financial crisis of 2008? Again, it's important to say that the polarization of modern American politics goes back maybe even half a century to the days of civil rights, which is what really repolarized and reorientated American politics, turned the South Republican and the North Democrat. Um, and then one would have to say that the 1990s and the Clinton administration saw a new type of Republican partisanship that was even more aggressive than anything one had seen before. But 2008 is highly significant because what it does is to break the coherence of the Republican Party. You see the party in Congress refusing to vote for the Fannie Mae Freddie Mac bailout, refusing to vote for TARP, which was to stabilize the banking system, despite the fact that this is a national crisis being presided over by a Republican presidency, and despite the fact that this is an election year. The GOP becomes a party essentially of protest against existing order of things, uh, a vehicle for expressing, if you like, emotion and frustration rather than really a party of government. In the wake of the financial crisis, so much was made about the morality or the lack of morality, if you like, of investment bankers. Has anything changed since then? Have lessons been learned? I don't think morality is part of the calculus of business people. I mean, they may pretend, of course, they're law-abiding folks like everyone else. Crime is not the driver of this crisis. Um, but their business and their legal obligation to their shareholders is to maximize profit. And they themselves are hugely incentivized to maximize their bonuses. What has changed is not morality. What has changed is risk. What has changed is the awareness of risk, the dangers uh, that you expose yourself to and the regulation of that risk. So the crucial category here is risk management, not morality. And that has indeed tightened up. American banks are more tightly regulated than they were before. They have substantially higher capital um, levels. They have bigger liquidity buffers. It's not a transformation. Nothing about the system has fundamentally changed, but it's the same old vehicle, but it's got tight brakes and we have better guidance systems for avoiding the kind of crash that we saw in 2008. It's at that kind of modest level that we can see substantial change uh, over the last 10 years. Adam, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. That was Adam Tooze, the author of Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the World. Thank you so much. Well, after the worst of the 2008 financial crisis, we were talking about it just a moment ago with Adam, millions of people lost their jobs. Many also lost their homes. More than 3 million foreclosures took place in the U.S. and many more around the world. Shona Bhattacharya and Florence Gayar report. Jesus Rodriguez landed on his feet in this low-income housing complex in Florida. But like millions of Americans, the last 10 years were a bumpy ride. At the height of the crisis, Jesus faced foreclosure. He had to leave his apartment with his wife and his children. I remember my kids were very little and we started selling everything. And they say, hey, 
Daddy, where are we going? No, we're going to Disney World. And he said, Daddy, is that expensive that we have to sell the, the fridge and the beds and everything? Jesus left Venezuela in 2005 and wanted to live the American dream. He found a low-paying job at a printer shop that allowed him to take out a mortgage with interest rates that skyrocketed as the financial crisis deepened. His American dream turned into a nightmare. A decade later, specialists agree the subprime collapse was inevitable because banks gave loans to almost anyone. People who had no experience, people, you know, someone, maybe, maybe someone who works in a hair salon who's all of a sudden buying four or five apartments because they can get the financing for it. Part of what we saw was uh, mortgage originators who were encouraging people to borrow more and more because the mortgage originator was going to make more money. The bigger the loan, the more loans they did, the more money they made. In 2012, a record 45 percent of mortgage owners in Florida went bankrupt. Throughout the Great Recession, more than 9 million people lost their homes. Well, that wraps it up for this special Inside the Americas on the Lehman Brothers collapse 10 years ago this week. See you again next time.